It was a cold December night a week before Christmas. My family always does Christmas in our Hamptons, New York, summer house. The Hamptons are always quiet this time of year, as a large chunk of the real estate there is owned by rich people who have two or three other houses elsewhere in the country. My dad and I were at the house first before the rest of my family, as my mom and sister still had work until the next weekend. My dad was retired at the time, and school was over for winter break for me, so we wanted to just go to the Hamptons house early. We all have our own bedrooms in this house, which sits on a quiet, dead-end road. My dad turned on the heat and water and all that stuff that he always has to take care of when we return for the first time in months. I brought my PS3 to play in my room. I spent most of the first day there playing video games. On that first night, we were there. There was a big snowstorm, another reason we wanted to come early to beat the crappy road conditions that would come for days after the storm. The next morning when I woke up and went out to the kitchen, my dad asked me when I built a snowman. I responded, What do you mean? He said, The snowman in the backyard. I went to look out the window and there was at least two feet of fresh snow, but there was also a snowman sitting in our backyard. It had two sticks for arms angled up into the air, and it had eyes and a smile carved into the head. The eyes and mouth side were facing the window. I said to my dad, I didn't build that. My dad left and said, must be the neighbor kids. My dad thought it was an innocent joke, so I did as well. The next night is where things got bad, though. I was in bed asleep and suddenly woke up to a distinct thump on my window. I was terrified. I pulled the blankets over myself to hide, to not be in view of whoever might be out there. But after five minutes, I started to wonder maybe it was snow that fell off the roof and blew into the window. I got up to peek out the window. I screamed because, at first, I thought what I saw was a person, but it was actually another snowman standing right outside my window. There was an angry frown on this one instead of a smiling face. I screamed for my dad and he came rushing inside. I pointed at the window and this time he wasn't happy. He said he would go next door in the morning and talk to the kid's parents. I slept in my sister's room the rest of that night. The next morning, my dad went next door and rang the bell, but they weren't home. There were no cars in the driveway, which meant they weren't even in town. That was the only nearby house with kids in it, so this didn't exactly help explain the situation. For five or six days straight, nothing else happened until Christmas Eve night. The rest of our immediate family, plus all four of our grandparents, were now in the house. We were in the living room. This was before dinner, but it was already dark out. Someone knocked on the front door instead of using the doorbell. We weren't expecting any other family. I started to get nervous. My dad went over and asked, Who is it? Someone on the other side of the door started saying, Please let me in, I need help. The door has no peephole or windows, nor are there any windows that would allow us to see who was on the other side of the door. My dad asked, What's wrong? And the voice on the other side said, I have no one to spend Christmas with. Please help me. We all looked at each other now, and my dad yelled to please leave before we call the police. The person on the other side said, Okay, I'll leave. Please don't call the police. He never opened the door. We instantly tied this to the creepy snowman. We knew it had to be connected, and we were right. On Christmas morning, there was a note taped to our front door. It said, to the best of my memory, I just wanted to have a little fun. I built the snowman for the boy in the house. I don't have anyone to spend the holiday with, hurt in one way or another. I think whoever left that note on our door and built those two snowmen was mentally ill or unstable. It's very unlikely that it was meant to be a joke, considering he came to our front door. I think he was dangerous, and even if he wasn't inherently hostile, the fact that he did what he did is just enough for him to be considered somebody none of us wanted to meet. It was Christmas of 2016. My name is James, and at the time, I was 21 years old. Our family was all at our Uncle Joshua's place for the holidays. Well, it was Christmas Eve. My immediate family, plus my cousins and other close family, decided to go to my uncle and aunt's place in downtown Miami. We come from Connecticut, 
so we're not used to warm weather around the holidays. It was Friday, the day before Christmas Eve. My brother Nico and I, being young single males and being in Miami, wanted to go out. We were hearing about a bunch of Christmas-themed parties going on at clubs and bars. Nico was 18 at the time, but he had a fake ID, so we figured he'd be all right. We went to this one club on Miami Beach that was having a Christmas-themed event. Mostly everyone online was wearing Santa hats, so it felt festive. But it was all a waste of time because at the front of the line, the bouncer not only told us it would be $100 to get in, but he also called Nico out on his fake ID. So he tried a bar not too far away. We got into this one, and there were some people wearing Santa hats here too. I guess that was expected on the weekend of Christmas. While we were at the bar, this older woman started talking to Nico. I overheard most of their conversation. The woman appeared to be mid-40s, and I heard her keep telling my brother how she has such a thing for younger guys with Hispanic accents. To be honest, it sounded kind of creepy and weird, but Nico was probably blinded by the fact that a woman was hitting on him. I just let him do his thing. The woman was wearing a blue Santa hat and had on a sexually provocative Christmas sweater. The two of them were talking for so long that I ended up making friends with the guys sitting next to me at the bar. Then suddenly, Nico patted me on my shoulder and said he's gonna leave with the woman. I told him, all right, I was happy for him, I guess. I stayed at the bar not much longer after that and just called an Uber back to my uncle's, assuming Nico would be spending the night with a woman. I was mid-Uber ride when my phone rang. Nico was calling me. I picked up to static. It sounded as though maybe he pocket dialed me, but I heard a male's voice in the background that didn't sound like my brother. And then suddenly, another male's voice could be heard yelling. I said Nico's name over and over, trying for acknowledgement, but the call eventually disconnected. Obviously, this was a pretty concerning phone call. I was under the impression he was alone with a woman. I tried calling him like ten times, and finally, someone picked up. But it wasn't Nico. It was the voice of some older man with an extremely deep voice. When I asked who this was, he said he found this phone on the sidewalk. I asked him if he could drop the phone off at my uncle's place, or if he could meet me somewhere. He didn't answer that. I just heard talking in the background, and then I heard screaming. It was Nico's voice in the background, screaming my name, screaming help, then the call disconnected. I asked the Uber driver to pull over as I was freaking out, trying to call anyone in my family. It was late, no one was picking up. I explained the situation to the driver and he advised I called the police immediately. That's what I did. The police came to my uncle's place, where I woke my family up, informing them that Nico was in trouble. I had to give my best description of the woman's appearance from the bar and what time he left the bar. Then my dad and I, along with the police, went to the bar that we were at, and it was then that I got a phone call from a random number. It was Nico. He was out of breath, gasping into the phone, explaining that he was kidnapped and barely escaped. He was currently using a stranger's phone. All of us went to Nico's location, which was a sketchy street somewhere in North Miami. When we found him, his face was a bloody mess. He had two black eyes, and all of his possessions that he had on him were stolen. He gave his whole story. He left with the woman who claimed to have called an Uber, a Lyft. When the alleged ride arrived at their pickup point, which was in some quiet back alley area, Nico found out once inside the car that it wasn't, in fact, an Uber. It was a trap. There were two men in the car who immediately held him down and threatened to shoot him if he didn't keep quiet. They started to drive for a while, and during this time one of the men called my number, and they threatened to harm him if he yelled out anything, which he did, and that explained the bloody face and black eyes. They broke his phone, took his wallet, keys, and whatever else was on him. As the car was stopped, and he wasn't being held down anymore, he ran for it out of the car. They didn't chase him. The car just sped off and disappeared. He said he believed they were going to kill him and dump his body somewhere if he didn't run. Police apparently were never able to identify the woman who appeared in the video footage from the bar. Nico said none of the men were wearing masks, more of a reason he thought they'd kill him. This completely ruined the entire holiday weekend, 
but we were all just happy he was alive. On Christmas night, we were all awoken to Nico's screams in the middle of the night. He was screaming, She's in the house! I woke him up from whatever nightmare he was having. I have to say, though him screaming, She's in the house! made me think back to her creepy smile and made me sleep with one eye open that night. I bought a small house with my brother George a couple of years back. We hosted Christmas the first year we lived in the house, just as a way of getting the family to see the place and getting everyone together for the first time in forever. We don't have the biggest family in the world, so it was the two of us, our parents, our aunt and uncle, cousin, and our sister and two nephews. Our sister came with our nephews and her husband first to help us out with the cooking and preparing. They brought their dog, Mika, along as well. Since they lived two hours away, they were going to be spending the night at our house. The rest of our family lives under an hour away, so they wouldn't be staying. Not that the house would have much more room for additional people staying over anyway. During our Christmas dinner, at one point, we talked about some of the murders that happened in our area recently. Bodies had been found in the woods in our county. It wasn't a topic that we kept going long, as our mom and my sister wanted us to drop it for the sake of the holiday and the kids. After dinner, we all had some wine in the living room with a Christmas movie on in the background as we talked. After a few hours, family started to slowly leave until it was just my brother and I and my sister, her husband, and her kids. The kids went to bed before us. The four of us stayed up later having more wine. My girlfriend ended up coming over past ten to spend the rest of the night with me, since all of her family had gone home. Eventually, Christmas night was over, and it was time to go to bed. I woke up to my girlfriend shaking me. The room was still dark. I groggily looked at the clock next to my bed, and it said 2-something a.m. I asked my girlfriend what the issue was, and she whispered, Listen. I listened and heard Mika out in the hall growling. I got out of bed and entered the hall to see what was going on. Then I saw that the back door to our house was wide open, and a breeze of cold air started to hit me in the face. Miko was looking out the door. I checked if anyone was out there, and as I was at the back door, I heard my brother's voice call out my name from the darkness outside. He sounded like he was far away in the woods. I was worried he was in trouble or needed help with something. I went back to my room to tell my girlfriend, and as I put my shoes and coat on, I stepped outside with a flashlight. There was a light dusting of snow on the ground, enough to see footmarks leading from the back door down to the back deck towards the woods. I yelled back George's name very loudly. I heard his voice call back my name. It was confirmed he was in the woods now. But oddly, as I entered the woods, his footprints slowly faded and got harder to see until they were just impossible to continue following entirely. I screamed back at the top of my lungs, Where are you? What's wrong? I once again heard George's voice call back just my name. Every time he called me, his voice was the same distance away. I was uncomfortable getting any further away from my house because I didn't want to get lost in the woods. I tried finally calling George's phone, but he didn't pick up. I continued a little further into the woods, but now George's yelling stopped. As much as I yelled out into the woods, there was dead silence, not even the sound of a bug in the freezing cold, just the sound of the light breeze. And suddenly, my phone rang. It was hopeful. It was George, but it was my girlfriend. I picked up and she said, Chet, George is in his bedroom right now. What? I said. That didn't make any sense. I was hearing his voice this entire time in the woods. I asked her to check if my sister's husband was also still on one of the pull-out couches, and thirty seconds later she said yes. Suddenly, I felt like I wasn't alone in the woods, like anyone was about to grab me from any direction. I turned back the way I came and started running as fast as I could. I didn't stop until I saw the backyard light from my house becoming more visible through the trees. I made it back to my house, and everyone was awake now. George and everyone else had a look of horror on their faces when I explained that Mika was growling, looking at the wide-open back door, and the fact that there were footprints leading into the woods. 
But the scariest part was that I thought for sure that the voice I was hearing was that of George, and whoever it was knew my name. We contemplated calling the police for half an hour, and then ended up doing so. A police officer came and just asked us any questions, like if anything was stolen, if we knew anyone that may mean us harm, etc. Then, within half an hour and after telling us to call back if anything else happens, he left. I don't know if I think this had anything to do with the murders that were going on at this time in our county, but I did think it was worth mentioning in the story. Nothing else did ever happen after that night, but we can't for the life of us logically explain any of this. I'm still scared to go in or near the woods past dark.